Mrs. Roberts from Corner Lake, and this week's First Chapter Friday is called Song for a Whale by Lynn Kelly. And these chapters are so short that I'm actually going to read the first two chapters of this book. Song for a Whale. Until last summer, I thought the only thing I had in common with that whale on the beach was a name. I sat with Grandpa after collecting shells and driftwood scattered along the shore and wildflowers from the dunes. The shells and driftwood were for Grandma, and the flowers were for the whale. Grandpa had asked how school was going, and I told him it was the same, which wasn't good. I'd been at that school for two years and still felt like the new kid. Grandpa patted the sand next to him. Did you know she was probably deaf, too, he signed? I didn't have to ask who he meant. The whale had been buried there for 11 years, and my parents had told me enough times about what happened that day. I shook my head. I hadn't known that, and I didn't know why Grandpa was changing the subject. Maybe he didn't know what to tell me anymore about school. The whale had beached herself the same day I was born. When she was spotted in the shallow waters of the gulf, some people stood on the shore and watched her approach. My grandma ran into the cold February water and tried to push her away from land as if she could make a 40-ton animal change her mind about where she wanted to go. That was really dangerous. Even though the whale was weak by then, one good whack with a tail or flipper could have knocked Grandma out. I don't know what I would have done, jumped in like she did or just stood there. She wasn't born deaf like we were, Grandpa continued. The scientist who studied her said it had just happened. Maybe she'd been swimming near an explosion from an oil rig or a bomb test. When Grandpa told a story, I saw it clearly as if it were happening there right in front of me. His signing hand showed me the whale in an ocean that suddenly went quiet, swimming over there, over there, over there, trying to find the sounds again. Maybe that was why she'd been there on our Gulf of Mexico beach, instead of in deep ocean waters where she belonged. Psy whales didn't swim so close to shore, only her on that day. A whale can't find its way through a world without sound, Grandpa added. The ocean is dark and it covers most of the earth, and whales live in all of it. The sounds guide them through that and they talk to one another across oceans. With the familiar sounds of the ocean gone, the whale was lost in her new silent world. A rescue group came to the beach and tried to save the whale, and they called her Iris. Grandma asked my parents to give me the name too, since I'd entered the world as the whale was leaving it. I like that. After the marine biologists learned all they could from her, she was buried right there on the beach, along with the unanswered questions about what had brought her to that shore. We lived on that coast until the summer after second grade when my family moved to Houston for my dad's new job. Since then, we went back just once or twice a summer. The good thing about our new home was that it was closer to my grandparents. I liked being able to spend more time with them, especially since they were both deaf like me. But we all missed the beach, and I missed being around kids like me. My old school had just a few deaf kids, but that was enough. We had our classes together, and we had one another. But it's different for us, Grandpa signed. Out here there's more light, and all we need is our own small space to feel at home. Sometimes it takes time to figure things out, but you'll do it. You'll find your way. I wish I'd asked him then how long that would take. Chapter 2 I'd come to the conclusion that sending me to the office was Miss Khan's only joy in life. <laughs> That made me responsible for her happiness, in a way, but I tried to slip into class without her even noticing. I was only a minute late this time, and I had a really good reason. She pointed toward the front office before I could even drop into my chair. When I got back to the room with my tardy pass, Miss Khan said to my interpreter, Mr. Charles, tell Iris to move over next to Nina so she can catch her up. She usually talked around me like that. Mr. Charles had told her so many times that she could just talk to me and that he would interpret the message instead of always saying, tell Iris. Finally, he gave up reminding her she was never going to get it. Also, I didn't need help catching up, and I, for sure, didn't want it from Nina. I'll catch myself up, I signed. When Mr. Charles voiced that from Miss Khan, her face turned even meaner than usual, which I hadn't thought was even possible. 
She didn't say anything else, just jerked a pointed finger to the space next to Nina's desk. The plan made sense to Ms. Khan because she thought Nina was the smartest person in the class, and Nina thought she knew sign language. She'd checked out a library book about it once, and so that made her an expert. Some people have the kind of confidence that lets them get away with being absolutely clueless. Nina signed something to me as I sit, slid my desk over to her territory. I asked Mr. Charles, did she just call herself a giant squirrel? He clamped his lips together and looked away while answering, I think she meant great partner. That was what I figured, but trying to make Mr. Charles laugh was one of my favorite things. I leaned over to the next row to look at Clarissa Gold's book. Mr. Charles interpreted my question when I asked Clarissa what we were working on. Nina tried to barge in with her flapping hands and made up sign language. When I ignored her, she got dangerously close to my face, as if I couldn't see her. My eyes stayed on Mr. Charles since he actually did know what he was doing. Nina's hands were like a swarm of flies I wanted to swat away, so it felt good to flick the wrist of an open hand to sign stop it to her. After Mr. Charles interpreted that, he added that it might be distracting to have two people signing at the same time. Usually he didn't jump in like that because he wanted me to take care of things for myself. So Nina must have been annoying him too. After a few minutes, Miss Khan came by to ask Nina, are you doing okay helping Iris? Yes, I think she's catching on, she answered. Catching on. I looked back down at my work so I wouldn't turn into one of those cartoon characters with steam shooting out of their ears. After I scribbled down the last answer in the workbook, I slammed it closed and I signed, finished. I was about to take out my phone so I could read the new newest issue of Antique Radio Magazine I downloaded that morning. If I opened a book on my desk, I could probably read some of the magazine by looking down at the phone on my lap. While my hand was sliding into my backpack, Miss Khan said something to me and pointed at her mouth. She'd tried that before, as if it would magically help me understand her. One night at dinner, I told my parents, Hey, I'm not deaf anymore. Miss Khan pointed to her lips when she, while she talked, and everything was perfectly clear. Can you believe you didn't even think of it? On the first day of school, Miss Khan tried to hold Mr. Charles' hand still to force me to read her lips instead of watching his signing. I didn't catch what Mr. Charles said to her, but she let go of his hands like she'd touched a hot stove and didn't ever try that again. We ignored the lip pointing, and Mr. Charles interpreted what Miss Khan said. I'd have to redo my poetry assignment from last week. That didn't make sense. The poem I turned in was really good. When Miss Khan returned with my paper, she looked like she'd bit, just bitten into a sour pickle. A normal expression for her. But right then, it looked like she was smelling something really bad at the same time she was biting the pickle. The red ink was the first thing I noticed when Miss Khan handed me back my paper. In the margin were the words, this does not rhyme, which wasn't true. The poem came from a sign language storytelling game I used to do with Grandpa. One of us would start a story and we'd take turns adding to it, one sign at a time. The trick was our hands had to keep the same shape for the whole story. Like if we started out with a closed fist, every sign for the rest of the story had to be made with a fist too. We'd go on and on like that until one of us couldn't think of something to add without breaking the handshake rule. My favorite story started with a tree full of leaves. A leaf blew away with a gust of wind, then landed in a river, floated down a stream, and onto the bank. It ended with a bird swooping in to grab the leaf to add her to the nest in another tree. We told her that story with our hands open, like the number five, the whole way through. It didn't look the same on paper. Paper is flat, so I couldn't use all the space above and below and around it that I needed to tell the story right. And the words in English don't have the same shapes as they do in sign language. But here's how it looked when I wrote it down. Leaves waving, blowing, twirling, floating current, land on a riverbank. Mother bird grabs the leaf and builds a new nest. I think it's beautiful personally. Sure, it didn't rhyme the way English words do, but I thought maybe it would be okay to turn in if I explained all that. At the top of the paper, I'd written a note about the poem. I wondered if Miss Khan had even read that part. A red line crossed through the poem, ruining it. I took out my own red pen and glared at Miss Khan. Below her, this does not rhyme message, I wrote, it does to me. 
Ever since Grandpa died, I wondered if he could still see me, if he was with me in some way. Right then, I'd hoped more than anything that he was nowhere near me. I didn't want him to see what Miss Khan had done to our story, to us. Everyone turned and looked at me as I crumpled the paper into a ball. Nina held a finger to her lips as always, like it was her job to remind me that things made noise and that I wasn't supposed to do any of them. But I did not throw the paper at her face. I flung it across the room, where it landed in the trash can, followed by the tree and the leaves and the river and the bird with her new nest, all slashed to pieces by a red line. Oh, I think this book sounds good. I hope you decide to check it out and read it. Have a great week.